Veteran astronauts had told me, okay, you know, space station is so big, when you're about 40 meters out, if you look out of the window, you will start seeing the outer pieces of it. And so about 40 meters, I start, you know, I kind of like float and loosen the straps and float above my seat and look around. Then I see something on this side, you know, at the far side of my field of view. And so I turn around and I'm like, oh my God, which I, I, I really say out loud. It happened totally by chance, just in those few seconds um, at sunset where the sun is really low and it has that orange light. The solar panels were like, were like a blaze. It, it, it was such a, a strong impression, you know, so beautiful and, and just so powerful. And so I just kept saying, oh my God, oh my God. And we have the transmitter on all the time in this phase. And so poor people in the control center, they're hearing this crew member saying, oh my God, oh my God. They're probably wondering what's going on up there. <laughs> and so Anton tells me, quiet, quiet. And I just couldn't stop. And I just, you know, in a hushed tone of voice, I continue, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I'm Samantha Cristoforetti, I'm an astronaut with the European Space Agency and uh, a few years ago I was a crew member on the International Space Station for Expeditions 42 and 43. And this is how I spent 200 days in space. I was a trained uh, combat pilot. I was actually finishing up my, my training and I was getting ready to start my um, operational life as a combat pilot in the Italian Air Force. And then all of a sudden there was this announcement, hey, the European Space Agency is looking for a new class of astronauts. And so of course that had been my dream since childhood. I just had to jump on the opportunity and I applied. We went from uh, 8,500 roughly qualified candidates to uh, eventually six of us who uh, were selected about a year later. Our generation was selected for long duration space flight. So we all knew when we go to space it's going to be for five, six, seven months. In my case, it ended up being six and a half months. There was no need to consciously prepare for that. It was always something that I just knew. Um, it was more about the, the practical things of life, right? Making sure that, uh, you know, your bills are automatically paid or somebody reads your mail. So I did set up an automatic response on my email and, uh, and, and I think it said, uh, I'm off the planet for a while. I'm back in May, I'll, I'll read your email when I come back. <laughs> So when you, when you get to Space Station, you realize that you've trained for many years and you're, you're obviously very competent on many technical aspects. You know, you know about all the systems and the experiments and, and spacewalks and robotics. Uh, but there's a lot that you have to learn in terms, in terms of really being able to, to go through your day smoothly. Uh, we need to be able to operate simply as human beings. So we need to be able to use the toilet, to eat, uh, to wash, um, and you know, and, and somehow get adjusted as quickly as possible to this very peculiar environment up there where everything floats. The typical rookie mistake at the beginning is that you, you do not put down something in a secure way and then guess what, you're going to lose it and, and then you're going to spend hours floating through the station to look, to look for the wrench that uh, get, flew away. <laughs> So we, we work typically until 7, 7.30 at night and then we have a, a meeting <laughs> like on Earth. It's, it's like a, a conference with the control centers around the world. Um, and then it's really up to every person what to, uh, how, how they want to spend uh, their time. I, I spent a lot of time in the cupola. I call it the space station veranda. The other modules of, of the space station, they are basically the solid cylinders and some of them have small windows that point down to Earth. But you really only see a piece of the Earth's surface beneath you, you know, it's like a, a river of, of continents or oceans flowing beneath you. Uh, but the cupola also has side windows, it kind of like sticks out. So you can really see outside and look at the Earth from horizon to horizon and then out into, into outer space. I used to spend a lot of time there, either just looking outside or, or taking pictures or uh, taking videos. 
first time that I looked out of the cupola, it was on the suggestion of my uh, crewmate, Terry. He took me to the cupola just before a sunrise was, uh, was coming, and that's, that's something just uh, amazing. So, you know, when, when the sunrise comes, it means that basically we're moving towards the east, so we're moving towards the sun, and the first thing you see is like this, this, uh, this thin, faint arc of, of blue on the horizon towards the east. It's almost like a, you know, a crack on a black canvas, you know, because the, the, the sky is black and the earth is black, and, um, and then it becomes bigger and wider, and then you start to see some orange, and then all of a sudden the, the sun appears. You look outside and you see pieces of the space station, and everything is flooded in this orange light, and it's especially it's impressive on, on the solar panels, because they're orange by themselves, and then they really seem to be glowing. And then, all of a sudden, after six, seven, eight seconds, then the sun completely comes up, and then you've got this explosion of white light. Um, and then you, you basically can watch on the surface of the Earth, as the, there is this line, which is called the terminator, which separates light from darkness on the surface of the Earth, and you see it unrolling, basically, you know, like it's almost like it's pushing the darkness away and more and more of uh, the earth beneath you comes in, into light. I think I moved from this state of constant excitement and discovery at the beginning where everything is, is new and you're, you're, you're soaking in so many experiences and information. You really have the feeling that, you know, time expands. After a week I was there, I thought, you know, I'd been there for a month. And then you become more and more adjusted to, to a life on space station. We definitely celebrated birthdays. Um, I had my birthday up there and uh, Terry and Anton both did as well, so we, we always got together. Um, you feel more and more like that's your home and that's your, your new normal, to the point that um, I remember maybe halfway through the mission I, I thought, okay, I, I want to try and feel in my mind, like really remember and feel in my body, the sensation of, of having weight, of walking. How is it when you're lying in a bed and you're actually sleeping and you, you, know, you feel that, that pressure on your back from you know, the reaction of the, of the mattress. So that, that, that life of floating and, and absolute lightness had become my, my, new, my new normal. And so you, you develop just this, this, this affection for, for this place that you start calling home. Um, and then there's Earth outside, and you develop a relationship with that as well. Again, you know, you, you go from this uh, sense of, of marvel and, and discovery at the beginning, you know, that this beauty of, of, of looking at Earth and this variety and, and all those firsts, like your first sunset and your first sunrise and your first aurora and, and so on, and to, to having this the sense of familiarity where you actually recognize places when you look outside of the, from the cupola and, and, and you more or less already know where you are at the first glance. Or sometimes even before you look outside, just by looking at the color of the light uh, coming through, you will know, for example, that you're on a desert. You know, it might be the Sahara or it might be Australia, but it's definitely like a reddish light. So more or less you, you can know where you are or what the options are. You're not super far away, right? You're, you're only at 400 kilometers. But at the same time, there is quite a sense of distance because even if it's not that far, well, it's not 400 kilometers in the horizontal, it's in the vertical, so it's very difficult to, to get there, to, to get to space and, and coming back safely. And then you've got this speed, you know, you're flying around the Earth of 28,000 kilometers per hour, so um, you kind of like look outside, it's not, it's not static, it's like everything is there for a few minutes and then it's gone beyond the horizon. On the other hand, I mean, because the entire Earth is this constant presence, which, which is not really the same. When you're on the surface, you're on the Earth, but when you're up there, what you interact with every day visually is like the entire planet. And so you feel, in a way, even closer to humanity and the planet as a whole than you are when you're actually on Earth. I mean, it's a little bit of a paradox, but I, I definitely felt that way. Weightlessness has a wide-ranging effect on, uh, on your body, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, researchers like to investigate. Not all of them, you actually feel them. You know, some effects on your cardiovascular system, your immune system, 
you do feel, uh, however, a number of effects when you when you come back that really make you realize that you know you, your body will need some time to readjust. The first thing is this the sensation of weight, right? So you've been weightless for six and a half months in my case, and, and your brain has just forgotten how, how weight feels, how to properly assess weight. We, we landed upright, so our capsule stayed upright, so that, you know, we was a pretty comfortable situation to actually get out. The first person to get out is the commander because he sits in the center seat and that's, you know, on your way out, so he got out. And then it was my turn. And in order to get out, I actually had to move myself from my seat in the left to the center seat. And so you do this movement, right, just to move on the side. And I remember <laughs> just lifting myself up a millimeter and just falling back immediately because my my brain hadn't used the right force. It, it, it had to relearn, okay, this takes so much effort, I have to mobilize so much force from, from the muscles. And that really uh, took, took some time, you know, at, at least a, a few days. Then there's your cardiovascular system. Um, the, the thing that I definitely noticed is that my, my heart was racing all the time. Even if I was uh, resting, you know, my resting pulse was almost 100, which is huge for a few days. And again, that's because your, your heart needs to get used again to work and, and pump blood against, uh, against gravity. And then there's the vestibular system, your, your sense of balance, which is initially completely off. Um, after a few days, I, I thought subjectively that I was back to normal, and, uh, and then they actually tested my vestibular system, but the platform said I was definitely not back to normal. You know, I, uh, as soon as we did something a little bit different than you know, just normal balance, I immediately fell. So at, at the beginning, I was very nostalgic. Uh, you know, just thinking that uh, space station was up there, and, and you can see it with your naked eye, right? You know, you look at it, and you know, there's uh, there's my friends up there. You know, there's there's six people, and life goes on up there. And, you know, they're they're continuing all the activities, and you know, I'm I'm not part of that anymore. And uh, in a way, it uh, it, it feels uh, it feels sad. Um, but then, of course, you know you. You get back into your normal uh, Earth routine and you don't think about it uh, uh, that much anymore. Uh, what definitely stays with me is, is a wish to go back. I definitely want to go back to ISS. Mm -hmm.